A pleasant good afternoon uh, to you all. Uh, my name is uh, Stafford Griffith, just uh, half of the few of you may not know me. And it is my pleasant uh, responsibility this afternoon uh, to take you uh, through uh, this uh, session for which uh, you have uh, kindly come this uh, uh, afternoon. I want to begin, though, by asking uh, uh, those who are seated at the back to uh, kindly come forward and fill the seats in front. Uh, the reason being that uh, we expect that there be a few people who will be arriving later and it will be easier for them uh, to fit in at the back rather than try to find seats in front. So if you would be kind enough to help us with that, um, I think we can get along in another few seconds. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Professor Emeritus, the Honorable Errol Miller, our guest of honor. Ambassador, the Honorable Richard Bornal. Pro Vice Chancellor for Global Affairs, University of the West Indies, from whom you will hear later. Uh, Deputy Principal of the Mona Campus, Professor Ishinkumba Kawa. Colleagues, past and present from the University of the West Indies family, other distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to welcome you to this third biennial Errol Miller Lecture. Permit me to say a special welcome to the Reverend Ronnie Twiggs, MP, a former Minister of Education who is gracing us with his presence uh, this evening. Minister, former minister, it is always good to see you. I'd also like to extend a, a special welcome to the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Education, Professor Waribinti, uh, Professor Wibinti, Wibinti Wariboko. Where is he? <laughs> You are, way in the distance. Welcome, um, Professor. This is the third occasion on which uh, I am privileged to serve as chair of this lecture in honor of the illustrious and nationally, regionally, and internationally acclaimed scholar and visionary, Professor Emeritus, the Honorable Errol Miller. The Errol Miller Lecture Series is intended to honor this exemplary graduate and distinguished former faculty of the University of the West Indies, Mona School of Education, who has made seminal contributions to the literature on Caribbean education and left an indelible imprint on the education system throughout the region, particularly in teacher education. The Mona School of Education is justly proud of the fact that this first graduate from its master's and its PhD programs has made such an outstanding contribution 
to the region's education system has impacted so many decisions in education taken in Jamaica and the rest of the region and has touched and inspired so many of us who now seek to follow the path of service to country and region that he has so clearly defined for us. In his 2015 biennial Errol Miller lecture, Professor the Honorable Gordon Shorty described Errol Miller as one of the most distinguished and innovative educators the region has produced, and also as an integrative thinker whose contributions to the field of education are legendary. In the time that is available to me, it will be well nigh impossible to provide a comprehensive documentation on Errol's accomplishments, both within and outside of the field of education. Permit me to share with you, and for some of you, I would have to say, permit me to remind you uh, that some of the well-known accomplishments of Errol include the first non-Englishman to be appointed to the Board of Trustees of the Lady Michael Charity in England, uh, founded in 1623. The first Chancellor of the Michael University. The first and youngest person up to that time to be appointed directly into the Civil Service of Jamaica as Permanent Secretary. The first educator from the Commonwealth Caribbean to receive the prestigious Andres Bello Award of the Organization of American States for his distinguished contribution to education. <laughs> Professor the Honorable Errol Miller also pioneered online delivery of degree programs in the Caribbean through the University of the West Indies Mona School of Education, which continues to this day to be a front runner offering such online programs. Uh, we owe much uh, to the work of uh, Errol in this regard. Many of you would know as well of his uh, more recent uh, distinguished service as chairman of the Electoral Advisory Committee of Jamaica and the many innovations uh, he led uh, in that post. Errol has what I call the gift of bringing out the best in those who have had the good fortune to work with him. He inspired many to levels of accomplishments that they would never have thought possible. This is a man whose contribution to the world deserves to be remembered and celebrated. The Errol Miller Lecture Series is but one of the opportunities for us in the School of Education to do so. The biennial, lecture, the biennial lectures provide the opportunity for eminent persons from the region and the wider international community, such as the distinguished presenter of this third biennial lecture, to share their perspectives on issues that will help to advance our thinking on matters of development and change in our society. Ladies and gentlemen, we are about to have another engagement in honor of Professor Emeritus, the Honorable Errol Miller. And I must say how delighted I am at the turnout this evening, bearing in mind uh, there are many competing events that are taking place uh, and uh, the threat uh, which I thought would have uh, affected us uh, of uh, uh, the weather. So uh, 
I'm very thankful that so many of you uh, have been able to make it. So again, welcome, and again, thanks for joining us for this third biennial lecture. <laughs> and now I would like to call on one of my colleagues uh, from the School of Education uh, who represents, I think, the future of the School of Education. Uh, she is a lecturer in language education in our school, and uh, she will uh, come here to introduce our guest speaker. Let me ask you to join me in welcoming Dr. Yuande Lewis Fokam to the podium. Where is she? <laughs> oh, right. Ambassador, the Honorable Dr. Richard Bernal, Senator Reverend Dr. Ronnie Thwaites, former Minister of Education, Professor Emeritus Errol Miller, our, the, 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 the um, focus, in a sense, the lecture series is focused on you. And Mrs. Buckle Scott, Deputy Chief Education Officer. Professor Ishen Kumbakawa, Deputy Principal of the University of the West Indies. Professor Waubinte Wariboko, Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Education. Professor Griffith. Director of the School of Education, Dr. Marcia Stewart, the head of J Jamaica Board of Teachers Education. Professors, we have here Professor Vereen Shepard, Professor Bewaji, Halden Morris, and other professors in our myths, in our myths. Specially invited guests, we have the UCJ group, I see them represented ably, Reverend Dr. Birchell Taylor, who is a spiritual advisor to Professor Errol Miller, Dr. Ma, <laughs> I heard that one, <laughs> Prof. Miller, Dr. Carl James, Specially invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you to today's guest lecture. Ambassador the Honorable Dr. Richard Bernal, Order of Jamaica, returned to the University of the West Indies in July 2016 as Pro Vice Chancellor for Global Affairs, having lectured in international economics and development economics for seven years in his early career. While at the university, he was active with trade unions, NGOs, and churches. He was educated at the UE, as well as the University of Pennsylvania and the New School for Social Research and the School for Advanced International Studies of Johns Hopkins University. He holds a PhD in economics and is an honorary professor at our own Sir Arthur Lewis Institute of Social and Economic Studies. Added to that, Dr. Bernal is one of the, U the UE's 50 distinguished graduates. Not surprisingly, as a member of the Order of Jamaica, he has conducted meetings with prime ministers, presidents, the heads of international organizations and CEOs of multinational corporations and banks, and has deputized for Jamaica's Prime Minister, Minister of Finance, and Minister of Foreign Affairs. Dr. Bernal was also Jamaica's ambassador to the United States of, of America and permanent representative to the Organization of American States for the period May 1991 to August 2001. 
Ambassador Dr. Bernal has appeared before several U.S. congressional committees of both the House of Representatives and the Senate, giving testimony to, on issues of concern to the Caribbean, such as trade legislation and economic development. He's almost a movie star. <laughs> he has appeared on television, including CNN and PBS, and on BBC Radio, and has been quoted in the Financial Times, Washington Post, New York Times, and Washington Times. <clears throat> he has published over 100 articles in scholarly journals, books, and monographs, and is the author of three books, of which I will share a quote from one. The book is Dragon in the Caribbean, China's Global Repositioning, Challenges and Opportunities for the Caribbean. This quotation is from the foreword by Alistair, Sir Alistair McIntyre. The picture he, Bernal, reveals is one of underutilized opportunities in exports, investment, and tourism. This is indicative that the challenge for the Caribbean is how to design a proactive involvement with the new global circumstances in a way that can promote their economic development and hence their political independence. Ambassador Dr. Bernal is deeply committed to the well-being of the Caribbean. And so we look forward to hearing his delivery where he explores how we can become more proactive in promoting high quality Caribbean education. Welcome, Ambassador Dr. Richard Bernal. Master of Ceremonies, <clears throat> Chairman, Professor Griffith, Dr. Louis Fulcom, thank you for that long introduction. <laughs> I ask only that wherever I speak, you come and introduce me in a, in a similar manner. <clears throat> Professor Errol Miller, it is beyond me to add any more accolades to what has been already said and written. I merely say to you that I feel <clears throat> greatly honored to be asked to do this in honor of your service to the university and the Caribbean. I offer this and hope that it measures up to your expectations. And I'm particularly honored. Former Minister of Trade and Member of Parliament and a member of the three R's. <laughs> member of the three R's. Um, Ronald Twits. The three R's are Ronnie, Richard, and Walston. And this is not an advertisement. We do a program on Fridays. It was his moniker, the three R's. I don't know if it comes from the three R's in education, but um, we do a program on the global economy on Friday. <clears throat> I'm also greatly flattered to see so many distinguished colleagues here. We have with us Professor Kawa, the Deputy Principal of the Mona Campus, Professor Wariboko, Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Arts. We also have several distinguished professors here, Professor Shepard, Professor Biwaji, my good friends, professors, faculty, students, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Good evening. I look forward to sharing with you some thoughts that I've been laboring over some time. And it's always good to accept speaking engagements because it's, it forces the birthing of these ideas. Um, I hope you will help me to refine them. My topic this evening is the globalization of higher education and the imperative for internationalization in the Caribbean. Let me begin by saying that what I'm suggesting this evening is that the globalization of higher education is a fact. It is accelerating, it is spreading, and it is not something that you can resile from or avoid nor should the Caribbean want to because it also presents an opportunity. But I think it means there's an imperative to respond. And in discussing this, I will suggest 
whether we have sufficiently responded and what else we might do to what else we might do to more effectively respond to this. Internationalization is both a challenge and an opportunity. It's a challenge particularly for small developing countries such as those in the Caribbean where our institutions are relatively small and lack the ability to go global or find it very expensive and difficult. But I'm offering some hope which is there are a variety of ways for the universe, for universities to internationalize and to transform the challenge of the global market for higher education into an opportunity which can be beneficial not only to the university in an academic way and in a financial way, but also can be a boost to the education system in the region. Because if we get the internationalization right, we will be promoting a new export sector. A new export sector with high-end jobs, high-skilled jobs at the high end of the value chain with potential linkages and an endless global market to surface. So we could be looking at a missed opportunity to develop a new dynamic sector to drive the growth process in the Caribbean. I propose that the way to go about this, the most efficacious way, is to form a cluster. Now a cluster is not a hub, it's not a grouping. It is a market-driven set of institutions which have commonalities and synergies. And in taking advantage of those, they collectively and individually improve their innovativeness and as a group become more productive, etc. So let me begin by saying Globalization, we all have a rough idea what globalization is. I won't try to add another definition to it. What I want to emphasize though, for all purposes, there are about seven features that I think are critical of the many features of globalization because they impinge directly on the sector of higher education. First of all, and I want to just go through this pretty quickly, connectivity. Increased connectivity changes how people learn, how they share information, and it changes education. And there really is now, through this connectivity, one knowledge and information sphere, and it's global. Secondly, the dominance of the market. Previously, universities were largely public institutions. Now there is a growing private sector which is very much market driven. And these institutions are not confined to their national countries. They have gone global, which means that what sets the tone in terms of standards, in terms of course material, pedagogy is global. Thirdly, intensification of competition. Globalization is the removal progressively of national barriers to international flows of goods, people, technology, finance, etc. And it's no different in education. There's an intensification of competition because the firms that compete are not in an economy or in a region, they're global. The man who is making sandals from old Mokta Karatas, he's competing against Nike sports sandals. And that's just how the consumers think now. Fourthly, there's a tremendous growth in trade in services. Services trade like tourism, etc., growing far faster growing far faster than um, the trade in goods. And therefore, higher education being a highly mobile service is no different. Fifthly, economies of scale. We used to think about economies of scale as something you attain at the level of the firm. Now they're attained in a global market across countries through multinational corporations, not through individual firms. Sixth, there is technology. New technology which is changing all aspects of globalization. For example, the biggest firm 
now handling accommodation for tourists is not a hotel. It doesn't own any properties. The biggest taxi company in the world is Uber, and it doesn't own any cars, and it doesn't employ anybody. So all of this is changing rapidly. And lastly, I would add, there is now a global mentality. People are so mixed, they're so internationally mobile, the information they imbibe, the entertainment is global, and they think globally. So in selecting a university, nobody is confined to thinking of, we're only going to go in our own country. They are shopping the internet across the globe for different experiences. Against that background, what that means now is that there is a global market for labor, for skilled labor and unskilled labor. Why? There's global mobility. You know this only too well in a country like Jamaica where so many of the graduates immediately go abroad. So they're thinking global marketplace. But secondly, even if you don't leave the country, you are in a global market because competition comes here. People come here, and when they advertise a job, people compete globally. The person who wins that job could be a foreigner. So you are in a global labor market. Thirdly, the future of work is changing. The days where you got a job, you worked in a company for 30 years, you got the gold watch, you retired. No, that's gone. In fact, if you look at a bio nowadays and somebody has stayed somewhere, and let me apologize to any long-serving members <laughs> of, of, of the university. <laughs> If you see somebody who has been, let's say, in one job, not one institution, one job for 10 years, you begin to worry that something is wrong. So it's changing. People now work from home. People now work on the internet. People work 24 hours a day. People work part time. So that whole type of work is changing. And lastly, technology used to eliminate labor intensive jobs. Technology is now eliminating high-skilled jobs. What that means that whatever you come out of university with, you may have to retool in 10 years or less, but it's going to change. And it means lifelong learning that also has implications for higher education. In other words, maybe we shouldn't see a graduate as somebody who has left us, but somebody who has completed their first part of their relationship with us. You bring them back, for postgraduate, then you give them special discounts as alumni, but it's a lifelong thing. So, global market. Now, why is it, why, having said globalization and, and everybody is in a global labor market, there is now, therefore, a person who, when they graduate, they want a global brand, and whether they want to or not, they may have to be mobile. So there are, is now a global market for higher education. That market is very lucrative. In 2020, it will be worth in excess of 20 billion US dollars. Now let's look at the aspects of this global market, starting with demand. All economists start with demand and supply. Um, let's start with demand. There is a total number of about 300 million students, university students, and about 10 million of them are globally mobile. In other words, they're willing to go to different universities, etc. On the supply side, the number of tertiary institutions have increased from 3,500 in 1950 to nearly 20,000 universities. So the supply is increasing, the choice is increasing, and this has been described as massification. Now, on the supply side, what are the motives? The motives to supply education to the global market. First of all, their financial gains. A lot of the movement globally is motivated by finance, but it's not the only motive. If you're going to be a global brand, you need to be present all over the world. You also need to give a student who is looking for a 
to be in the global labor market. Needs a global standard education, but needs a global exposure. To come to UWI, they want a semester in China and a semester in France, etc. That's what students are looking for now. Um, the modes of delivery, there are really three. One, selling on the internet. That's growing rapidly. Secondly, students, foreign students coming to go into a foreign country to study. And then thirdly, there are where universities set up branches. For example, a number of universities with good brand names in the US set up in Singapore and the Middle East because very lucrative. Rather than the students traveling over there, they just carry the educational institution to them. So that's happening, and it's happening in the Caribbean. We're going to come to that. Um, now, what are the requirements to be in this global market, to supply the global market? First of all, of course, you have to have a good product, or a product that is perceived as comparatively good. Secondly, you have to be competitive in price, because people have to shop price. You also have to have a brand name that's recognizable through um, being ranked. There are a number of international ranking systems. And good students go first to these ranking systems, and they can tell you this university is at 150, and this one is at 280, and so on. And you also have to have marketing. This is a competitive business. No matter how good your product is, if you don't advertise it in an imaginative an encouraging way. For example, I saw one university that in selling their product, they said, they didn't say anything about what they offered. They said, we are where your future begins. We are going to do X and Y all the future. Since they said nothing about what they do. But that was a way of saying to people, you're, you're graduating and you're going to have a long career in the future. We can wear the stepping stone. So all of that goes into it. Now, I would suggest that all of this means that every university in any part of the world has an imperative to respond to the global market for higher education. And there are two needs to respond to. One is opportunity. But two is defensively. And when we talk about the Caribbean, you're going to see how much competition there is in the Caribbean. Now the question that obviously comes to mind is the Caribbean, can it really supply the global market with higher education? That question comes up because we are in a situation where 40, 50 years ago there was a monopoly on higher education in the Caribbean of Caribbean institutions. A few people went abroad, but now there are 150 universities and colleges operating in the Caribbean. There are over 60 universities selling services into the Caribbean. And that means that this little market, the Caribbean market, I think is vastly oversupplied, but there are 150 institutions. And they proliferate. I make no comment on the following. I merely observed that there is a place called the All-American Institute of Medical Science in Black River, Jamaica. And they showed me a picture of a two-story residence. But it just shows it the extent to which there is competition. Because I'm sure they have students, or they wouldn't be in business. Now, <laughs> the, we, what is our supply capacity in the Caribbean? We have the following kinds of institutions. We have public institutions, UWI being one, UTEC. There are institutions all over the Caribbean, public institutions. Secondly, there are private nonprofit mainly institutions started by the church, and they have some very respectable universities. And then there are four profit institutions, both local. We have one that's listed on the Jamaica Stock Exchange, and a number of foreign universities that have set up. Now, 
These universities seem to be doing very well because they continue to grow. We'll come to that. There's obviously some capacity to supply it because there are 10,500 students, medical students in Canada, but there are nearly 4,000 Canadian students who are studying overseas. So it tells you that there's some supply, and many of them are studying in the Caribbean. Now, what else can we note about our capacity to supply? First of all, we have certain disadvantages, and the main one is the disadvantage of small size. But I think there are ways to overcome that. So we have some capacity to supply education in the Caribbean, and that capacity is increasing with these private, foreign, and local institutions. The other question that comes to mind is, OK, so you can supply a degree in economics or geology, but who is demanding this on the global scale? Is there a demand for education for the Caribbean? And I would suggest that there is demand. And I cite the following. One, if you look at the number of institutions that have grown in the, in the Caribbean market, many of them are servicing foreign students. Secondly, the Caribbean has a very strong comparative advantage. Our cost of a degree here is far, far lower than doing it in most of the developed countries, and you're getting a comparable education. I also suggest to you that we have Caribbean content that not only Caribbean people want. There is not only the diaspora, but there's a whole global market out there. When you offer a course in um, reggae or Caribbean literature, there's a global market for this. And it's a huge market, and it's a growing market. So there is a demand for, Caribbean, for education from Caribbean universities. And I add one other thing. One of the selling points for the foreign universities that have operated here is that they present a wholesome environment that people will send their kids to. People feel very comfortable with their kids going to St. Kitts and to Barbados. They may not be as comfortable in some other locations, but um, the point is that the atmosphere and where people send their kids are also important. And the Caribbean, with its wonderful climate, people, tourist industry, is an attractive place. Now, there is a huge unmet demand for higher education. Our, uh, our open campus, which is teaching my internet, we have maybe about 8,000 students at this time. However, there are, and we're only talking about United Kingdom universities, there are 66 universities selling online through the internet into the Caribbean, and they have 22,000 students. Those are potential students for Caribbean universities. So there is a huge unmet demand out there. I'm not saying there are not other factors. People may want a foreign university degree, whatever. But it shows you that there's a big unfulfilled demand. I cite another thing, which is that we gave one scholarship here for students from Africa. And we, when we went through all the vetting, there were 326 qualified African students who wanted to come and study in the Caribbean. So there is a demand out there. Well, of course, demand has to be effective, but needs to be matched with resources. But there is a demand out there. Now, I suggest, too, that there is a huge demand in certain disciplines. There are 70 medical schools in the Caribbean, 70. And they're in business. Some of them have attained respectability academically and scholarly, 
and their students are accepted and their qualifications are accredited. But I'm just saying that, you know, we take in here uh, about 320 medical students a year, but there's a whole vast foreign exchange paying student body out there that could be tapped. Now, I raise that because the imperatives for internationalization is not just opportunity, it's not just um, what you could gain. You have to look at our environment. Our public institutions are under pressure because governments are having fiscal problems and that is limiting their capacity to support public education, especially when it has to compete for resources with secondary and primary education. And in this kind of milieu, one of the ways for universities to enlarge and increase their efficiency and also to improve their financial stability is to go to the global market, both by getting students here and by um, exporting over the internet. If you look at the student body here, and uh, I say this without bias, UWI is the premier higher uh, education institution. And out of a student body, we have 20 here at Mona, about 18 at St. Augustine, another f of nearly 40,000 students. We have 100 and 44 students from the United Kingdom, where we have a vast diaspora. So it must tell you that there's something that there that we're not fully exploiting. Now, what are the challenges in going global? First of all, we are small, but we have quality, and if we can expand over the internet, then Supplying a larger student body doesn't mean a vast investment in infrastructure. You can offer an internet course to 10 people or 10,000 people. So we have that challenge, but it's over, it can be overcome. Secondly, we face the problem of institutions which don't collaborate effectively so that each university is doing all the same things that everybody else is doing when the we could be sharing. So there are a number of challenges. Another challenge is the cost of getting visibility in the global market. You have to be able to spend some money to be seen and to be heard and to become visible. Even the business of being ranked. You have to pay a fee to be ranked in certain um, <laughs> ranking systems, and these are costs. And so if you're going to go global, there is a, a challenge there. Now, having laid out the challenge, I always believe there is a solution to every problem. And I think we can find it collectively. I am suggesting that the way to meet these challenges is what I call a regional higher education cluster. It's a trans-Caribbean cluster and uh, it is a market-driven cluster. It's a cluster that involves public, private, non-profit, and private for-profit. It does not compromise the integrity of any one institution, but it draws on the strengths of the respective institutions. I maintain there is a lot that public universities can learn from the for-profit institutions without compromising their standards about how to be more efficacious in student treatment, in recruiting, etc. And I believe that this kind of cluster can operate across the Caribbean. And I believe that this cluster can overcome the problems we have been talking about. One of those problems is productivity. I think that sharing uh, the synergies, the exchange of information, the collaboration can reduce cost and improve our productivity. Secondly, it can increase innovation because we learn from each other and we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Thirdly, we stimulate new synergies associated with this. For example, 
if all the universities collaborated, maybe there'd be more Caribbean publishing. There'd be all kind of spin-offs. These institutions, too, can help to provide a more diverse and wider range of offerings. You can offer a unique experience. Come to a university in the Caribbean, spend a semester, come to a Caribbean institution, an English-speaking country, spend a semester in a Spanish-speaking country, spend another semester at a different university that's French-speaking, live among different cultures, you begin to produce a more interesting product for the student and a better learning experience. They get a diverse cultural exposure, they become more exposed to the global, and they have a wider set of courses they can choose from. It also gives you economies of scale and scope. And finally, it improves the financial viability because there is a huge global market to be gained. And it brings in foreign exchange, which in some countries is um, scarce. Now, what do you require to have this higher education trans-Caribbean cluster? You require the following 10 things. Only the best institutions can participate. This is not for everybody. This is an attempt to raise quality, raise global visibility. There has to be a minimum standard. So only the best. Secondly, we have to build on the existing cooperative arrangements. There are numerous associations of Caribbean tertiary institutions. Some are confined to the Caribbean. Some include Latin America. Some include institutions in the US. There are all these institutions on which we can build. We're not meeting each other in different universities for the first time, but we have not been doing business together, and that's the difference. We can build on that. Thirdly, you need an extensive international marketing and networking campaign. You can't go to the global market as easily as one institution. But if you're going as a whole region of, say, 20 or 30 good universities, then you begin to attract attention. Four, you have to advertise the diversity of the experience and the learning which you can have in this, this, this cluster. Fifth, it's a public sector, private sector partnership. There's a lot that public institutions, and I don't make this about any particular institution, I state it as a generality. There's a lot that we can learn from private institutions about being more creative, more nimble, more opportunistic, without compromising quality. And they certainly can up their standards by resorting to what we have to offer in the public sector. Seven. We have to produce these joint degrees. Every, people are looking for joint degrees. You can have joint degrees within the Caribbean, or you can have double degrees between the Caribbean and Africa, Caribbean and the US, for example. University of West Indies is doing a double degree with University of Lagos, doing one with University of Johannesburg. We have an arrangement with a university in Suzhou where we're doing software engineering two years in the Caribbean, two years in China. This is the future of education, and we need to get more into it as a collective in the Caribbean. Eighth, we really have now to be a global brand. You have to set out to establish yourself visibly, globally. Nine, you have to have physical presence. It's great to be on the internet, great to be in a cluster. But you have to, people have to be able to go somewhere and see your name on a building. <laughs> somewhere in London, Tokyo, or somewhere else. That is part of the visibility. Look at firms. There's manufacturing in, say, Germany. They're selling in North America. But you still have to have a physical presence there that the consumer can see and learn from. <clears throat> the last one I'll leave for the I will suggest that clusters can form naturally, even when they're not market-driven, but we need to inject an element of leadership. 
I will leave it as an exercise for the audience to find out which university I think is best placed to take on this leadership of the cluster. Um, but may I be explicit and say I think the University of West Indies is well placed to lead this and there are benefits in doing this. <clears throat> now, I would conclude by saying that there is value to the inst institutions, there's value to the students, there's value to the faculty, ex exchange, etc. All of this is good. But in addition to this, we could be starting an export sector of higher education, which has the potential to drive economic growth in a sector, in an, a situation where this was the region worst affected by the global financial crisis. In a situation where we have some sunset industries and where we are finding it difficult to diversify our exports. This is something we have a comparative advantage in. This is something that doesn't require great financial capital. It requires ingenuity and it is not beyond us to create this trans-Caribbean cluster which can then become the core of a new dynamic sector to drive economic development. And I will close by saying that in doing that, we also improve the sector of higher education in the Caribbean. And no set of countries can become developed without a first-class higher education system. So I leave those thoughts with you as a suggestion as to how we might do good for higher education and for the Caribbean. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador, Ambassador Bernal, for a very thought-provoking uh, lecture. We will now take uh, uh, some questions and uh, comments uh, from the floor. But before I do so, I wish to acknowledge uh, and welcome a number of persons who joined us um, uh, after I had extended uh, my own uh, welcome. Uh, and if you would permit me, I'd like to especially welcome, I thought I saw the former minister <laughs> <laughs> of education, but she might have left, right? Eh? Oh, she's coming back. So in her, in her absence, I can, I can acknowledge that she has joined us, and I can extend a special and warm welcome to her. All right, um, we will take a, a few questions and comments, but I would uh, implore you to uh, try to be short with uh, the questions and comments so as to optimize the opportunity uh, to all uh, to participate in uh, this uh, discussion that follows. Uh, is there anyone who would like to start the ball rolling by either a question or a comment? Yes? While we try to sort that out, I'd like to take the opportunity as well to say a very warm welcome to those who are Yes, I'm saying I'd like to say a welcome to those who are participating online because this session is being streamed. Uh, Dr. Gentles, I see that the technology is not being kind to you.
concerns about what seems to be a really excellent idea is that you know we, we have this reputation in Jamaica and the Caribbean of having all these wonderful products that we think about exporting and then when it comes time to do it we fall short for many reasons. One of my concerns is that um, I think currently at UWE, um, I'm not sure about other universities, there's a serious problem for faculty. We're seriously underpaid when we compare you know, ourselves to other um, counterparts in other universities. Um, and, and I think many people commit to teaching in the Caribbean because they want to be nation builders. You know, They want to do good for their country. But that can only go so far. And future people, young people, faculty coming in, are not willing to make that commitment as readily as some of the older ones. So how, you know, how does, has this, is this something that factors into what you've been thinking about? And what are the benefits for all of this for us at home? Um, you know, on a, on a personal level. All right, before we ask Ambassador Bornell to respond, uh, we'll take uh, two more questions or comments. <laughs> okay, Sylvia Cohen, uh, High Western University and Boston University specifically. And I'm following up on uh, Dr. Gentle's question because what was on my mind was exactly along the same lines. Uh, we have a master's in speech language pathology that uh, we developed in collaboration with the Faculty of Medical Sciences for the past almost three years we have been trying to appoint a director of the program. The program has great potential um, in terms of international appeal. The market for speech language pathologists in North America is, in, is extremely competitive, very difficult to get into programs there. Of course we are hoping to um, offer this program so that we can uh, fulfill a regional need, but beyond that regional need we have the potential to be training speech language pathologists for the North American market. But as long as we cannot appoint a director, we have no program. And we cannot appoint a director because we cannot offer a salary. <clears throat> Given the competitive market in North America, excuse me, we cannot offer a salary that any um, potential director, qualified director, qualified person, finds um, it to their benefit to be Thank you, Professor Cohen. We will take uh, one more comment or question uh, before Ambassador Bornell responds. Thanks very much for a very nice lecture. Um, just quickly, I would ask, uh, since the private sector is likely to benefit greatly from this, how do you rope them in so that they can help with the funding? Asin? Yes, please do. Okay, thank you. Um, one of the things that runs through my presentation is that the answer to the pressing financial situation which public universities face, and that includes salary. Incidentally, a good batsman knows which boards to leave alone outside the Amsterdam. That's above my pay grade. So I'm going to stick to the one which says we have to earn. What I've set out in the lecture is that look, there is a vast market out there. We have a comparative advantage in cost. We do have quality. We do have unique products. I'm saying that. To get into that market is not a huge investment financially. Teaching 10 people, teaching 20 people, giving an online course for 10 people. What has to happen in public institutions? And I wouldn't, of course, be speaking about my own creative and entrepreneurial university, but as a generalization, there's a lot more creative things and that's why I'm saying what the cluster is good about is there are some things we can learn as public institutions from private institutions. We have a better branding, we have a better product, and they're making a fortune. So all I'm saying is we need to earn more, and it is possible. When you earn more, you then can get better salaries. Now, you have, you, there is a problem, I'm not saying it's easy, but you have to earn more, and once you earn more, you'd pay better salaries. Not only that, you would earn in foreign exchange, 
the university then can invest that, not just in education, but in assets that earn, etc. So if the private institutions, and I've worked in the private sector, I've worked internationally, there are no geniuses out there. They know smarter than the people in our institutions. We can do this. It's a mindset. There's a mindset in public institutions that governments are always going to be there. Yes, they have been here for the last 70 years supporting universities, but these are difficult times. We have to help ourselves. There is absolutely no reason why we can't do more on the internet. And it's possible to do more with attracting foreign students. So I'm saying that learn entrepreneurial things from the private universities. Apply them here because we have the quality, we have the staff. We can do this. But you just have to get out of the business that we need government support. We do. But if it's short, then we need to earn. And I'm saying you will raise salaries when you earn. Otherwise, this business of continuing to press governments to raise money from international donors, that's not a long-term strategy for financial viability. And as you both point out, financial viability relates to capacity, to staff, to quality, the numbers, but we have to earn. So, like any business in difficult circumstances, we have to be creative and earn, and we can do this. Okay, thanks, uh, Ambassador Bernal. We'll take uh, three other questions or comments. And I see uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Alan Morris, is uh, willing to go. Uh, thanks very much, um, Professor Grivitz. Um, thanks, um, Dr. Bernard, for that presentation. I think it is very timely and insightful. Uh, I am a positive person, but I'm quite concerned about the cluster concept because we, I think we have challenges clustering even within ourselves. And I'm just trying to figure out how we would manage that cluster mechanism and how we will divide the spoils. <laughs> Vision of the sports is always important issue. Yes, you can uh, uh, can you kindly say because I recognize uh, most of the speakers you have Can you kindly say to uh, uh, ask your question of Dr. Colin? Oh, I'm sorry. Please move. All right, thank you everyone. I want to thank the for his presentation. It was very informative. He gave us a vision in terms of buying into, into the Caribbean. My question to you, no, Dr. Shreya, is that, oh, I'm sorry, I'm actually a master's student in Tibet, leadership in Tibet, and we're at the UW. My question to you is that, if we are going to develop such a system and a mechanism in Jamaica and the region, what would be uh, similar to um, my previous uh, professor, of course, what would be the real impact and implementation of this? Just because other countries have different perspectives and views, and that will be one of the contributing factors to such a thrust. So how would you mitigate against such a thrust uh, and implement this strategy? Because it seems to be very um, productive in terms of our education system, and it can really move Jamaica and the region. But what would be um, the answer? Uh, there. Someone else ready to go? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Cassandra Nicholson, PhD student in the Organizational Behavior course. Um, it's really more unlikely a comment than a question or anything. Um, I was very interested in coming to this lecture because the concept of expo exporting education in itself to me seems to be a significant, well, might be a significant contributor to our issues that we're having in the Caribbean. I've noted just in my own anecdotal way that we all, we're we always complaining about our nurses, our teachers, and our labor force being stolen from us. And Professor, um, Ambassador Bernal came up with a concept that I thought I've been saying for the longest time, but has never been actually 
persons have never come on board. Every time I told the concept of, listen, let us start exporting or educating individuals. Let us stop complaining about bravery. Let us stop complaining about people being stolen and just export our education. So let's get this business of getting our persons out here so we can get the funding in and stop being myopic in our view that, listen, it is only here. Every time I told that I hear the bots coming out of it. So I just, well, I'm just saying, as the next generation of administrators, that this is where I'm at. And I get a lot of negatives when I say it. So I'm just noting. So thank okay. you for the comment. Okay. I'm going to start with the, the last question. I think it's a, a fact that we have to face that many of our graduates are leaving. That's why I talked about the global labor market. Some leave because they're going to greener pastures. Some leave for push factors. Even if they stay here, they're in a global labor market. So let's accept that. Um, it's an open question as to whether the GDP they generate abroad and send back as remittances is less or more than if they had stayed here. So let's face the fact, people are going to move. Now, what I draw from that is if people face the fact that they are going to be international and more back, they want a certain kind of internationalized education. They want a global brand. And if you're going to be a global brand, it's hard to do it as a single university. You're doing it as a cluster. People say, Caribbean is somewhere to go and study medicine. Yeah. The Caribbean is somewhere not just to go for a holiday, but the same way you have a reputation for tourism, you can have a reputation for higher education. Of the 11, 11 top universities in science, seven of them are in Asia. Now, 10 years ago, that was not so. They have, in Singapore and in China, they have taken a decision that they're going to develop higher education and export it. And I'm saying this is potentially good, not only from what it can earn, but it can cross fertilize. If you're selling 20,000 people in a course on the internet, for an exchange you earn from that could maybe lower the fees for students here or top of the salaries of people here. You have to earn the days when you can just go to government for more money. And this is a global trend. It's now global that people say governments don't have a responsibility to educate everybody to university level. It's happening globally. So no point wringing the hands about extracting more from governments and borrowing more and raising money from alumni. Earn is the way to go. Other less competent institutions are doing it. So I say earn. Now, I should have stopped taking questions after the first three questions, but it was going well. And like all good West Indian batsmen, when it's going well, I continue. The two questions have put their finger on a problem that I believe is solvable. I can't give you a prescription, but what I can say is we have ingenious entrepreneurial people. This is a question we put not to Academics is a question we put to businessmen. How do you make the cluster a working business thing? How do you manage it? How do you get earnings out of it, etc.? I don't have that answer. I have gone as far as I can go in saying, this is something we should do and we can do. This is now to bring in your businessman and you say, let's run this thing and make it pay. Okay? Um, I left the business sector a long time ago, so I wouldn't pretend to have the answer. I should have answered with the whole cliche that lectures are about helping people to ask better questions. <laughs> I think we have done well, we have proceeded very efficiently with these questions and uh, I think we can take another uh, three questions.
And we'll see what happens after that. <laughs> uh, as long as we uh, proceed efficiently, I think we can get a few more questions. In. Thank you. Good night, everyone. I'm Dr. Sam Stewart in higher education, so I'm quite happy to be here with some of our students in comparative higher education. I had a question um, regarding the cluster, and I think there is some help because you have set a visionary tone um, and solution that has been done in other countries, such as the ASEAN nations in Southeast Asia, and more known in the European Union with the Erasmus program, of which some of us in here probably are graduates of. I surely am one. So I see that there is already lenses with that. With both types of clustered higher education groups and cooperatives such as that, they have managed to be successful the last four decades because of their also economic and government practices, right? And so I had a question regarding CARICOM and whether or not is, would CARICOM be engaged be in this practice alongside the private sectors in these multiple countries? Thank you, Dr. Stewart. So we are open for two other questions or comments before uh, Ambassador Bornell responds. But we have to be efficient about this. Well, let me answer this one. All right. Um, I agree with you that this is not something that can be solved. We have to just think that we are in new, uncharted circumstances in higher education. It's not only changing here, it's changing globally. We're caught up in this. It means we can't think the traditional way. For example, maybe this is a project to give to the Mona Business School and you say, look, you run this as a business, or you give this to UWI Consulting, or you outsource the management. You call in a private company or Google companies and say, here is an idea. This is what we need. The student I was not born as a private public partnership. So I'm saying, use this, take it to some business group and say, this is our idea. We need to get X, Y, and Z out of it. You run it, okay? We don't have to run it. We just need to get it done. And I remain convinced. I, I don't have any problems at Caribbean people have been able to work on. This is solvable. This is doable. It is doable. I stop there. Thank you. That uh, seems to be the cue uh, to bring the questioning to an end. But um, uh, I would, uh, I would go for hoping for one more question, just in case. <laughs> Some more. Well, the and feel that we are not providing that opportunity, but you have to be very fast. All right? Once. Twice. Someone there? <laughs> okay, first. All right, so thank you uh, again, uh, Ambassador Brunel. And now, uh, to take us uh, to another plane of engagement, uh, we'll have a musical item from a student uh, from the College of uh, Agriculture, Science, and Education. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I ask you to help me to welcome uh, Ms. Jonel Hart. Are you going to give us a musical item? Good evening again. Mm -hmm. So Oh, my God. 
Mass General. I thought we were getting one, we got a two, and I'm sure you've left us now wanting more. <laughs> uh, very good talent, I'm sure Case is very proud of you. But I want to encourage you, after you finish with Case, come to us at UWI, <laughs> not the right environment. Okay, well, we, we have been privileged over the last two biennial lecture um, to have uh, had the man himself. And this, uh, our third biennial lecture, we are also privileged to have uh, the man himself. And I wouldn't stand between you and Professor the Honorable Errol Miller, who would want now to share a few thoughts with you. So please join me in welcoming Professor the Honorable Errol Miller to the podium. Chairman, Professor Stafford Griffith, I hope you allow me to say all protocol observed. <laughs> this is not out of disrespect for the persons who I should mention individually, but when I look around, I see so many persons from the hierarchy, professorial colleagues. I see friends that have been with me almost all through the years, my church members who have, and pastor, and colleagues I've worked with, people who have rescued me, saved me from myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I see so many young people getting interested in what is going on that I think I probably need to go into the few remarks I'm going to make almost instantly. Um, first of all, let me thank the School of Education, uh, particularly Professor Griffith and members of staff of the school. Uh, I, because of the interaction, I know that Dr. Lambert has had a lot to do with, with this. My usual approach to things is one time can be such and such. Twice is not yet a tradition or a system. But when it comes to three, there is a possibility <laughs> <laughs> that it could continue. I have been involved in many lectures of this type. So I thank the school for carrying on for three years. And I thank God for being able to, be, to attend all three. I also want to apologize for my wife not being here this evening, and particularly to Ambassador Dr. Bernal, because she was one of his students in economics um, at this university, and also one of his colleagues within the Inter-American Development Bank, and therefore she thinks the world of him, and she called me just before coming to say that I must express her regret, particularly of not being here to hear it. Um, I've listened to Dr. Bernal's lecture and a lot of thoughts have gone through my mind. Um, I'll just tell you this. First of all, for all the glowing accolades that uh, Professor Griffith led you in and all about my career, let me just say, I, I say, thank God. To God be the glory. I never set out, I have never, I have, done, I have not lived a planned life. And let me give you the metaphor that comes to me. When I first came to the university as a freshman, lived in, was assigned to Chancellor Hall. And in the ragging that took place, one of the things they did <laughs> was to wake you up early one morning, put a lot of ashes and all kind of other such stuff on your head, took you down to the pool, and push you in. Well, fortunately, they didn't go straight to the deep end. But where they pushed me in, there was covered me right over. And I had a sense 
that I could drown. <laughs> because the depth was taller than six feet two at the time. So, but I didn't panic. I, I, I sort of went and held on to the edge. And since there was a slope, I walked slowly up the slope till I got above where my, I could breathe. And that's the story of my life. It's, I've been pushed in at the deep end <laughs> in almost everything. And by the grace of God, <laughs> found a way <laughs> to find a process that would take me out and learn from it. What amazes me is that Dr. Bernal seemed to have found a way to push an entire group of people <laughs> <laughs> in at the deep end <laughs> where we are covered and, and, and the challenge will be to find a way <laughs> because really, this is an issue to be tackled. Um, I have to say this, that my experience of, of the deep end and coming out of it, I, I come back to, to what I learned from persons who went before me. Um, and since it has to do with economics, I, one of my, the persons who saw a talent in me that I didn't know I had was the Honorable A. Wesley Powell, principal of Excelsior. And he would take me around after a little while, begin to show me some things. And I remember we had a, we had a, a weather system that knocked out school. And, and when I went, I, I, I was usually present. Whatever was happening, I was at school. So he was going to the bank, and he, and he, and he told me to come along with him. And he said to me, Errol, let me tell you something. You may be the greatest educator in the world. If you can't find money to do it, it will not work. <laughs> he said, my father told me, and I have taken it for life, I'm passing it on to you, that there are three things in this, in this Jamaica, color, class, and cash. But the greatest of the three <laughs> is cash. <laughs> so, <laughs> Whatever I've done, <laughs> I've always tried to find a way to get the cash. I tell you this, we don't have to go, I, I speak for educators now, because eco economists think a little bit differently from educators, but I tell you, some of the most entrepreneurial people are in the school system. The only problem we have is that when we are teachers and principals and we are making the money, we are afraid of people in central authority because they still have a plantation mentality that we must work for them. And then when we get the cash, they take it. Because central systems, governments, <laughs> governments, governments and top people at the center has an insatiable appetite for cash. <laughs> and I, I have to say this without, I hope I've not offended anybody, but the, 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 and I've, I've experienced this in more than one place. The Ministry of Education is one of the top agencies to, ex, to extract cash from the people who make it out there in the school system. So, so I, I'm saying that the cash is a really important aspect of it. But the other thing that I found in my experience is that people, we always underestimate the people and what we have. And the first place to look is not to some people outside, but to the people we have in the particular situation we are working, and to look at the talent and the property and all the other things we have to see how we can generate. Also, we, it's a problem to start with everybody because not a lot of people want to take the risk of an entrepreneurial activity. 
A lot of people want to see somebody take the risk first and then they jump on the bandwagon. So, go with the ones who want to go. It don't have to be everybody. Go with the ones who want to go. The talent that is there. Um, in that regard, I must tell you that um, my orientation through life has been to serve and to serve my God. And I've recognized that I'm nothing but a steward. What is required of a steward? There are three things that are required of a steward. One of them has a lot of theological problems that I don't want anybody to get mixed up with, but, but I've worked it out for myself. Um, a steward has to be faithful because the steward don't own anything. Everything you're dealing with does not belong to you. But you have to treat it with integrity and to be able to pass it on in, and do what is required of you, what is the purpose and intention. There has to be integrity in stewardship, in being faithful to the charge of the resources that you are given. Number two, it must be fruitful, it must multiply. 34, 50-fold, 100-fold, but a steward must be fruitful. You, you, you can't go and bury the thing. So you have to find a way to add value to make it multiply. And the third thing is a steward must be shrewd. Have to be shrewd. 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 <laughs> If my language isn't good enough, <laughs> pronunciation I'm mean, good enough. You, you have to understand that you cannot be neutral in this life. If you're, going to be a, if you're going to be a faithful steward, know that whatever new thing you're going to bring in is going to replace something that exists. And that which exists have people who have vested interest in what is there and will resist any change you want to make. Because they are benefiting, even if it's a worse situation, they are benefiting from what exists and will block the problem. So when you are being the faithful, fruitful steward, understand who and what you're working with and build the coalitions that will allow you to resist those who want to keep the thing back and to work with those who want to move it forward. The steward cannot be neutral. And the steward has to realize that the most important people to protect are the vulnerable. And the persons that must not be exploited are the vulnerable and the people who must be the greatest beneficiaries are those who have been marginalized. If we can understand that about what we are doing, and let me tell you something. There are bad-minded people in this world. <laughs> yes. But I'll tell you this, my experience of this, my experience in this here Jamaica and the Caribbean, to every bad-minded person, there are three, four decent people, honorable people, who will not see you falter. So don't be preoccupied with the bad-minded. Thank God for them. Because many times the thing they plan for your hurt only makes you go forward. And know this, anytime people begin to attack you, look carefully at what they're saying because they're attacking you at your weakest point and with respect to your faults. And if you can learn from them and address those issues, you will be stronger and stronger and stronger. And if it's only you you're after when you get them fully into their vulnerable situation, Wipe them out. Don't kill them, but lick them down. <laughs> Let them understand that the thing, the bad mind is and the thing that they're going to, will not prevail. Make peace with them. 
And also, <laughs> I hope you don't take these things too serious with the millerism, you know. <laughs> but the, it's my experience. And let me tell you something. No matter how you plan and how good you think you are, the collective wisdom is always superior to the individual genius. And in anything that you're doing, you must have at least four sets of people. You must have some old fogies that they have been through, the, they have been battered and bruised, and they know everything that can go wrong. Don't listen to them when you have to decide what to do. Because they're going to say no. You need some young people who don't know better. <laughs> who don't know all the, the problems that could occur. And they have energy. And, and they, will, they will take all the risks involved. You need some insiders who know how to navigate through the, the deep waters. <laughs> and you need some outsiders who ask ignorant questions. <laughs> but they are profound. It causes you to look at what you had overlooked. And if you can put those together and Forget those who are miserable. Forget all the faults that everybody has. But keep that group together and get, move with them. We can overcome anything. My last point is this. About this globalization and the global market. The first time I realized that we are global was in Singapore. No, sorry, not in Thailand, 1978. I had gone there to a, a, a conference, and after, because I didn't think I might get back there, I was doing the various, I took one day off and was doing the various tours. The tour of the reclining Buddha, the golden Buddha, all kinds of Buddhas. And they took us, the, 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 these tours were largely done by a, a driver in what we call a minivan, Toyota, you know, 15-seater. And this day, this guy was taking us, can't speak English very well. He would deliver us to people who knew English, who could take us through the particular thing. But he didn't know much. But he was playing Bob Marley. And not in the modern version, you know, where the government yard, no. Tenement yard. I don't know how many of you know that version <laughs> about living in a tenement yard, not a government yard. And I'm saying to myself, he's playing this thing over and over again. And I'm saying, what does he know about a tenement yard? Then I realize that the lyrics and the rhythm had touched his soul and spoken something to it that made him identify with it. And so one of the things I learned that when we tackle the real problems that exist in this here region, we are tackling global issues. The Caribbean is not a backwater. We are on the very frontiers of the development. We are a modern people of lesser means. <laughs> and there are some things in which we have great expertise. Now, if you look at this education, you will find that we have much greater expertise at the primary, early childhood, and secondary. We match the so-called first world at every level with these. Technical assistance should be coming from us. Tertiary is different because the British recruited people 
from outside, and they had to depress the development of tertiary institutions in order to justify it. They did a number of good things. Don't, don't, get, don't get me wrong. But in that reason, they did it. And in a great deal, we are not developing enough of our people. So the, my first goal in the global thing is to globalize our people in terms of reaching higher levels of tertiary education within the region itself. We cannot be satisfied with 20 and 25% of our people going to college. And they are, they are all over, and the potential is there. So that's the, 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 the challenge. In my day, should I say, now I've left there, I was always convinced of, of one thing. That our economic systems are tied into the powerful, and they define the terms of trade and everything to their advantage. And therefore, but our education system is tied into our national system, our local destiny. So we can always produce far more talent than our economies can absorb. So in the 19, from the 1970s, anybody who went to Michael will tell you that I would say to them, let me tell you something. Get the highest level of education. I don't care if the ministry say you must be bonded and you, you, you must go teach before. I'll sign your certificate that allow you to go on, but because you must get the highest level of education and find the opportunity wherever it exists in the world. The, the Communist Party is, is, in, is infiltrating us through ideology. The Americans through capitalism. We have to do it individually. And our people have been going across the world and, so, and excelling. But i tell you something. Wherever you go, if you can make it, stay here. But wherever you go to find the opportunity, remember, first of all, how you got there. Let the people know where you are. Contribute constructively to the place you're living. That they must ask you where you come from. Because they have to respect you and respect us because of what we bring. Secondly, don't forget, and it, those are the days of apartheid, don't forget your black grandmother in the country <laughs> who sacrificed <laughs> to put you here. And don't forget the institutions that allowed you to reach here. Give back. So I know that is when you're exploiting it individually, people. We have had a long history of this. Our development has, has had a long history of this. Our people going abroad and making it successfully over the last hundred and odd years. What Dr. Bernal is challenging us, and this, this is where the deep end really is. He's challenging us not with people, but with programs. And I don't have an answer to that. <laughs> Because, but I know the programs must be born out of our own knowledge that we have generated. It, 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 must come not, it must come from the knowledge we have. So it, it calls for knowledge generation, not only of straight scientific research, but out of hard-headedness. And then as the world is going, I, I, I'm going to get myself in trouble with this. As the world is going, STEM. <laughs> high tech. Remember, we are a people of high touch. <laughs> 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 we know how to deal with other people, to make people feel good. We have an audacity in the Caribbean in which we have never evaluated ourselves totally in terms of how other people evaluate us. There is a spirit that comes from here. And education is not only about competence and content. It is about character. It is about, it is about spirit. It's about the ways of perceiving the world that does not accept just what is, but looks to what ought to be. 
And if we can find a way to put these things in programmatic terms, we will exploit the world just as they have exploited us, but with a difference that we would have added some value, lasting value to it. So that it's not just about exploitation, but it is about adding and improving people's lives, helping them to live better, helping them to know each other more. So, Dr. Bernal, thank you for this lecture. I am excluding myself from the solution. <laughs> the, 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 I've always believed that if you're going to do anything for the future, you must have people who are going to be there. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that my days are numbered. Uh, so thanks again. I know Dr. Lambert is going to give the vote of thanks in every way, but, but I, I thank the school, I thank Dr. Bernal, I thank all of you who have come. As I look, I see friends, and people who I really treasure in this life. And I see young people, and it's a great audience. So thank you very much. I share your delight that we were able to have uh, Errol uh, talk with us. Uh, very enlightening discourse and a lot on which to reflect. And uh, perhaps we have gone to such heights uh, that we really do need uh, Janelle uh, to come back and to help to soothe us as we reflect. Joel, Joel, Joel. It's Joel this time. It's Joel. OK, it's Joel who will come back to soothe us as we reflect uh, on uh, uh, what we have just uh, heard from, uh, um, from Errol. So do we have Joel here? Oh. Am, am I having the name right? OK. Jo oh, Joel Lee.
Mr. Joely, uh, for transporting us into another very pleasant space. I think now that you've advertised your talent, you should uh, make sure you let us know that you would have that solo concert for the Cantor of the Footboots. Well, we are at that point where we need to bring the parties down on the evening's proceedings. And for that, uh, we are going to ask uh, someone who has become somewhat a, of a professional in uh, moving motor cans for us uh, in the School of Education. But uh, this time around, uh, I really need to thank himself. I'm going to wait to see how he does that one. <laughs> I ask you to help me to welcome, bring the curtains down, uh, Dr. Clement Lambert. Chairman, distinguished ladies and gentlemen in the council room, and those joining us live via internet streaming, the third biennial Edward Miller Lecture has been delivered. Responses and discussions have ensued. Performances have been rendered. At its culmination, mine is a role as the chairman of the planning committee to say thanks to many, the many persons and entities who have contributed to make this event possible. To our lecturer, Ambassador the Honorable Richard Bernal, I thank you first for responding positively to the invitation to deliver this lecture. We thank you even more for your presentation on exporting Caribbean education. You have expanded our cognitive horizons on the exciting possibilities that exist for Caribbean education and the global outlook that only you with your vast compendium of global professional transactions could convey. Your points were presented with a clarity and profundity worthy of this evening's event. While your impressive profile describes you as a squash enthusiast, I know, despite your roller coaster ride, as with many of us, with the West Indies team, you are a cricket fan. <laughs> you gave an outstanding knock at the crease as the opening batsman that steered the innings to a magnificent conclusion. Thank you, sir. I now invite <laughs> Dr. Saren Stewart, lecturer of the School of Education, to make a presentation to the Honorable Ambassador. Dr. Stewart. Thank you. We are indebted to you, Professor, and I always love to boast my former boss, the Honorable Errol Miller. Firstly, because it is because of your professional life, stewardship, and scholarly example we are here today. We thank you, Prof. Miller, for accepting the invitation and making yourself available for this evening's commemoration. For your prudent and profound remarks, and simply for being the stalwart you are in national, regional, and global development. Thank you, sir. <laughs> we also thank our many guests, including those from the Ministry of Education, Youth, and Information, Chief Officers, Regional Directors, and Officers, for graciously accepting our invitation to be here this evening. We recognize the unfettered support of our Dean, Professor Warabuka, and members of the faculty of humanities and education, and the wider UWI community who have graced us with their presence today. We thank our guests from various spheres of our community, tertiary institutions, partner schools, government and statutory bodies, the church family, friends, and of course, fans of Professor Miller who have taken time to experience this landmark occasion. It simply would not be the same without you. At this point, I would like to pause to make two special presentations in recognition of the contributions of two special individuals who have been integrally involved since the first Earl Miller Lecture in 2013. First, let me call Dr. Marcia Stewart to stand at the front of the, the hall. Dr. Marcia Stewart. The manager of the John Board of Teacher Education, 
Marcia served as the chair of the planning committee for the two previous lectures and as committee member for this lecture. Dr. Stewart, with dignity and poise and alarming efficiency, has promoted this and other events that have national and regional significance. On behalf of the committee members, we want to say thanks, and we are all better for your service to the UWI, the country, and the region. May I ask Dr. Paula de Morris to come forward and make the presentation to Dr. Stewart. color scheme going on there, maybe there was something. <laughs> Next, let me invite the Director of the School of Education, Professor Stafford Griffith, to the front of the room. <laughs> we salute you, sir, for supporting the event from the proposal stage to realizing this evening's occasion. In addition, I would like to thank you for ably cheering this and the last two proceedings in your own inimitable fashion. Prof. Griffith, I unequivocally speak for the planning committee and the wider school of education population that you have never been shy in investing your trust in your team members to fulfill the mandates of the school of education. The opportunities you have provided for us to grow, anchored by your support and advice, has been the hallmark of your leadership. We thank you again for being a tr the true leader of this occasion. I now invite Dr. Marcy Rainford to make a presentation of the Prof. Griffith. Thank you so much. Members of the planning committee included Mrs. Nadine Valentine, Ms. Rosemary Campbell, and I have to say their names twice, Mrs. Matt Nadine Valentine and Ms. Rosemary Campbell, Dr. Carmel Roof, Mrs. Velitha Davis Morrison, Dr. Yuan de Lois Focom, Dr. O'Neill Mondel, and Mrs. Tashane Haynes Brown. I thank them for their contributions of varying degrees to the success of this event. For this evening's entertainment, we thank Ms. Donnell Scott for sharing her vocal talent accompanied by none other than Mr. Case from Case. <laughs> and Ms. Joy Lee for the mellifluous violin solo. Thank you for sharing your talents and providing that invaluable aesthetic dimension to the occasion. We also thank the following persons and entities for their input in the event. Administrative support, Ms. Nadine Davis, Mrs. Marcia Murray, Ms. Katie and Leslie. Ushers, administrative staff of the School of Education, UWI. Lecture venue, Ms. Florence Francis, facilities manager and her staff. Videos and pictures, Mr. Aston Spaulding. Live video streaming, Mona Information Services, I'm sorry, Mona Information Technology Services, MITS. Public Relations, Marketing Recruitment and Communications Office. Caterers for what you're about to receive, downstairs, I should say, Cuisine Art. You have all contributed to the success of this event. The third biennial conference lecture has now come to an end. We thank all the contributors, and most of all, we thank the Creator for making it possible. Thank you. Uh, usually, I will merely say it just left me to say thanks to uh, Dr. Lambert. Uh, but this time around, I, I would wish to extend on that and uh, to share with you, if you have not yet figured it out, that uh, Dr. Lambert served as a chair of the planning committee uh, for this third Errol Miller biennial lecture. And I was challenging him because I wanted to see how he could thank himself. Now, since he cannot do that, I'm going to ask you to join me in thanking him tremendously for his hard work. Well, we have had a, a wonderful evening without any doubt. 
uh, I want to uh, wish you a safe travel back home, but I also would uh, ask you to stay for a while and meet your friends and uh, colleagues with whom you have not had a chance to talk uh, while you're here. And you can do all of that uh, downstairs, as uh, Dr. Lambert said, uh, where we have some refreshments for you. So thank you again very much, and walk with me.